read the scripture, I thought about what to answer. And I thought about saying, well, I knew he was behind in his Bible reading. I don't make it in that. And then I thought about, and it's so, so unusual for me, being raised in South Georgia, to hear a black man with a, an accent from the Bronx. <laughs> That I enjoy hearing, and it's kind of like the kind of like the fellow that came upon this frog that told the guy that um, if he kissed the frog, then he'd be able to be turned, uh, or he'd be able to to get like uh, maybe a hundred thousand dollars in money. And he looked at that frog and thought about it, and he put the frog in his pocket. And he heard the frog hollering at him, "Let me out of your pocket!" You know that if you kissed me, then you, you'd get $100,000. And he said, well, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you, Brother Mark, for leading us in the scripture reading. Everyone knows that it's been raised in church, the story of the Good Samaritan. Amen. Our text, verse 36 of Luke 10, asks the question, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. And no doubt our Savior gave this story to illustrate the second of the two great commandments, namely to love your neighbor as yourself. But there's also a wonderful picture here of how Jesus the good Samaritan Jesus the good neighbor can rescue an individual who's been wounded by the devil, beat up, and get a hold of him and save him. Amen. Amen. And then I think, turn over to a, a church to take care of him until the Lord returns. About the time Ms. O'Neill and I got married, which I know was a long time ago, State Farm Insurance came up with a little advertising ditty saying, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Yeah, right. And I don't want to start any fight with don't anybody fight. Don't fight with uh, about insurance companies. I no longer am insured by State Farm. Amen. But the indication was that they would be there when you need them. Yeah. They'd be like a good neighbor. Yeah. And I want you to know that the very best neighbor that you could ever have is my Savior. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the State Farm and you will bear with me. The title of this morning's message is Like a Good Neighbor, Jesus is There. Amen. Which one do you think was a good neighbor to that man who's fallen among thee? It was Jesus. Pictured by the good... I say, Jesus is there when you need Him. Amen. When you need Him for conversion and getting saved, I want you to know you won't have to track the Lord down. He's near and He will save you. You need Him for comfort, He's there. When you need Him for cleansing, He's like a good neighbor, He's there. When you need Him for courage, He's there. When you need Him for companionship, Jesus is there. When you need Him for counsel, He's there. And even when we need Him for correction, he is there. Amen. Now I want you to think from this passage, and if you still have your Bibles there, you can you can look at it with me. By the way, did y'all notice I've got a new Bible? Amen. 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 I, yes, sir. I've decided to change, and this year I'm preaching from a New King James Version. Amen. No, not the New King James Version translation. A new copy of the old King James Version. Amen. If you've got that new King James Version, you just need to swap it in for a real Bible. And I'll be glad to. We've got a treasure for trash campaign concerning bad Bible translation. And if you bring us a bad one, we'll give you a King James Bible. Doesn't matter which one you've got, we'll take it. We'll put it on a shelf somewhere. But, and if it looks just like my old King James, it's because it's just like that one. Miss O'Neill just likes to spend my money on Bibles. And uh, this is what she bought me for Christmas. 
I don't know if y'all have noticed, but I also decided to wear black suits this year. Amen. Anyhow, anyhow, I don't change much. But in this section of Scripture, there's a wonderful picture of the Lord caring for somebody that other people overlook. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to witness in a, in a household. And I was talking about, I remember, right before I got saved, the two men came into our house from a church. And I was 14. And they witnessed to my mama and my daddy. And as far as I can remember, and I understand it's been a good while, but as far as I can remember, those men never said one word to me. You know at the age of 14, most boys are pretty wicked. Amen, preacher. You know at the age of 14, most boys... Actually, no deep down, they're wicked. And they may not have been called out on it, but that day, when they were talking to my mom and dad, the Holy Spirit called me out on my wickedness. Yeah. And I felt like that if there was no other sinner in the room, I was a sinner in the room. Amen. And I'm so glad. And I'm not, I'm not blaming anything on those men, because I don't remember, I just don't remember that they ever said a word to me. I'm glad Jesus cared about this boy. Amen. Amen. And I want you to know Jesus cares about you. Amen. Amen. Better than a good neighbor. Yes, like a good neighbor, Jesus is there. Yes. From verse 30, I want to say to you this morning, whether you're saved or lost, this is the truth. People are damaged. Right. All of us are what we might call damaged goods. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, you know when you married that man, you married damaged goods. Or you know when you married that woman, you, you got some damaged goods. Well, the truth is, until Jesus gets a hold of you, we're all damaged goods. Amen. Verse 30, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Mm. You know, they left him half dead. Do you know that reminds me that a lost man is dead? Yeah. And you might even say he's half dead because his body's alive, but he's dead spiritually. Amen. Amen. You have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2. By the way, once you get saved, there's a sense in which you're half dead too. The only thing is, is your spirit's been made alive and you're to reckon your body to be dead unto sin Amen. and alive unto righteousness. And, but in a practical sense, I will say this, even Christians, practically speaking, can be dead. And I've, I've heard prayers today praying for me to be filled with the Spirit of God. I want to be filled with the Spirit of God. I pray that, and I appreciate your prayers for me for that on a daily basis. But if a Christian is not filled with God's Spirit, and if a Christian is not living for the Lord like he should, practically speaking, a Christian can be dead. I hope that's not you. I believe that all across Jacksonville, there are churches, as well as individual believers, who could have it said about them what was said about, I believe it was the church at Sardis in the book of Revelation, where the Lord said to them that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. That is, for all practical purposes, they're not working. They're not producing. They're not doing what God would have them to do. They lack good works. Well, speaking of people that are dead in trespasses and sin, they've been worked over by the devil. Mm -hmm. I look at people, and you do too, and if you and I aren't careful, we'll look at them with disdain and disgust yeah. mm -hmm. when we see people that the devil has worked over. Yeah. Wow. It's a sad thing to see. Yeah. You see them walking up and down the streets. Yeah. You meet them coming in and out of the retail stores and restaurants that you go to. Some of them are hitting you up for money. They're panhandling. 
And you see these people and you realize that they're in bad shape. I'm not trying to negate your thought that they need to learn responsibility. I'm not trying to get you to feel like that, that they probably brought all of it on themselves or some of it on themselves. Probably sometimes there, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. But I'll tell you something else. The world, the flesh, and the devil are not the friends of mankind. They're not your friend. And if you see somebody out there in the world that looks like they're 70 when they're 20, and all their teeth are gone from drugs when they're 25 years old, you need to remember that there, except for the grace of God, go you. That's right. This man had been beaten up. And when we see people like that, rather than be disgusted, may the Lord help us to have the heart that the Good Samaritan had. Amen, preacher. And I'm not just talking about putting some food in their mouth or giving some cash when you don't know what they're going to spend it on. But I'm saying that we need to care about people out there in the world that don't really look like the most responsible and respectable people that we'd like to have for our neighbors. Amen, and like to have our children around. The Bible says concerning this, this man that these thieves, and by the way, that's a picture of the devil and his devils. The thief cometh not but to kill and to steal and to destroy. Amen. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful that Jesus will give back what the devil took away from him. Amen. I'm glad that he's able to supply. I'm glad that he's able to change. I'm glad that Jesus is able to revive, renew, resurrect from the dead. I'm glad that Jesus can turn a sinner into a saint. I'm glad that Jesus can turn a devil into an angel. I'm glad that Jesus is able to make you something totally different. Amen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Amen. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. We take people where they are after they get saved. I don't know about you. I don't expect them to be mature, mature Christians in five minutes. That's right. And I realize it takes some time. That's right. But I thank God they're saved. Amen. And I expect that if they're saved, there's somebody inside of them that is saying amen to everything that's preached that's right. Amen. Amen. That's why I preach with confidence. That's why I preach with authority to you people here. Because if it's right and you're saved, there's somebody in you. Amen. That reinforces what you're hearing. You may not hear it with an audible voice. I don't claim you do. I don't hear voices. But I'm telling you that there's somebody in you that whatever you want to call the impression, there's somebody in you that lets you know that that's the truth. Amen. As a matter of fact, I believe when God's dealing with unsaved people, that the same Holy Spirit does the same thing. Amen. Yeah. If you're unsaved and you're sitting here today and, and this preacher stands up here and says, you know, you're a fool if you go out of here without trusting Christ as your Savior. Right. You don't have one promise of tomorrow. That's right. And maybe your flesh and the devil in you is saying, that man's got no right to call me names. He don't even know me. He don't know what I do. He don't know how bad I am. But if the Holy Spirit's helping you and dealing with you, even if you're unsaved, you work on you. there's something that lets you know what he's saying is the truth. Amen. I need to get saved. Yeah. I don't, you may put it off, but there's something inside of you that's saying, I really need to get saved. I'm going to get saved one of these days. Any of y'all ever been through all of that? Yeah, I'm going to get saved one of these days. I really am. But yeah. not today. I want you to know it's the Lord that, that is helping you. But people are damaged. They strip this man. And you know sin can strip you of everything that would make you respectable. Yeah. Sin can strip a man of kindness, intelligence, respect, character. Hey, if you don't believe it, you go down to the uh, Trinity Rescue Mission and spend time talking with people down there. Some of the men down there, ladies, our ladies deal with the ladies, 
Some of the men down there are men who had those things and sin and the devil stole them. That's right. Amen. Stripped them. Yep. That's right. Not only did they strip him, they stole from him. Sin has stolen many precious things from people. They've lost their health, lost their money. There's men who loved their families, but because they were unable to get themselves loose from their sin that they were entangled in, they lost their wives and children. That's right. Sin will not only strip you, it'll steal from you. Then they struck him. You need to remember that the devil may promise you things, but he's not your friend. He's a destroyer. Amen. He is an enemy. And then they stranded him. You remember the story of the prodigal son? He had friends while he had money. When he lost his money, you saw his company was, it was a pig. And the only reason why the pigs were hanging around him is because he was feeding them. Same way with those people. You know, when the devil's through with you, you'll discover that the friends that you thought were friends were not really friends at all. That's right. Yeah, preacher. Yeah. That's right. The second thing I want to say from this passage is that it's often true concerning people who are damaged that passers-by are disinterested in your situation. Passers-by, I think of uh, verse 31 and 32, certain priests came down that way, and when he saw him, he passed by. Verse 32, Likewise, the Levite looked on him and passed by on the other side. The psalmist said, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Some people are preoccupied, and they don't see it. May God help us to keep our eyes open. Amen. You may have an opportunity today to witness to somebody except being preoccupied. I know getting an exact change back to you may be important, but it's not as important as it is you keeping an eye on the person that's at the cash register and thinking about you're saved, are they? Amen. Amen. Profit seekers would lose money if they stopped long enough to help him. Pleasure seekers were too busy enjoying themselves, they couldn't help him. Pious people, holy people, might not think he's a good prospect for church membership, so they pass by him. But praise God for this man who'd been beat up. And right, it reminds me of a uh, verse in the Old Testament from which came a saying that used to be in the old movies. Somebody was making fun of me. Wednesday night because I didn't know some of the old cars. That's okay. The people that were talking were here before cars were invented. <laughs> the, the, the truth is, there are some old things that can bring back memories that are real precious to you. But there may come a time when you get to this situation where you're so beat up and you're so hurting that you just cry out in anguish like they used to do in these old films. Is there a doctor in the house? Anybody remember that? Amen. Go ahead and bet how old you are. Amen. Is there a doctor in the house? The Bible says, is there no physician there? Is there no bomb in Gilead? And I'm glad that for the man who'd been beaten up, there was a physician who was dispatched from heaven. He's called in the passage, the Good Samaritan. You say, what are you trying to point out? What I'm trying to point out to you is, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. He was a Savior in this physical sense right here, this man was. And it's a picture of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. See, the Samaritan came to where he was. Look at it if you have your Bibles there. Verse 33, the Bible says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. I'm glad that God became man. I'm glad that the Word was made flesh. I kept stretching, I kept reading.
religion, but I couldn't reach God. And that's what religion is all about. You can determine you're going to quit some things. You can determine you're going to start some things. You can determine you're going to get baptized, join the church, and all that. All that is religion. It's all you try to reach up to God. Salvation is God reaching down to you. Amen. And the Samaritan came to where he was. So glad Jesus came into this world. Amen. He came into this world to save sinners. I want you to notice his coming. Then I want you to notice the Savior's compassion. The Bible says he had compassion on him. We read of our Savior that he looked on people and he had compassion on them. Then I want you to notice the care in verses 33 and 34. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Those are things used in the Bible as medicine. The Bible talks about over the book of James, anointing somebody with oil and praying over them. I don't believe that's a ceremonial anointing of oil. I believe it's God anointing the medicine that you put on somebody and you pray over them and you pray for God to do the healing. Amen. That's what I believe. That's right. And scripture with scripture, the only place I know that talks about uh, healing with association with this is right here with oil. They pour in oil and wine. By the way, you'd do a whole lot better if you'd spend some time <laughs> using uh, things like rubbing alcohol and all kind of oils to take care of a lot of your things on your body. Amen. 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 Don't drink the liquor. <laughs> Go buy some rubbing alcohol. Amen. And, uh, and put it on. And if you got a doctor that prescribes for you to drink the liquor, I would change doctors. Amen, preacher. Amen. Because I wouldn't even look at that stuff. Yes, sir. Notice the Savior's cure. The cure was, and by the way, oil and wine in the Bible are often associated with two things. The Holy Spirit and joy. Amen. And when Jesus <clears throat> binds you up, when Jesus takes care of you after the devil has beat you to death, saves your soul, he gives you the Holy Spirit via the new birth. Amen. And he gives you the joy of knowing your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. I like that bumper sticker that says, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Amen. 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 I'm glad for the good Samaritan that came by. Notice the Savior's carriage. He put him on his own beast, the Bible says, in verse 34. And then his care for him, he brought him to an end in the end of verse 34. And the Bible says he took care of him. Yes. And you know what? Jesus can fix any sinner. Amen. Not only can he save your soul, take you to heaven, but Jesus can fix what sin has done to destroy you. Amen, preacher. You've heard me talk about him, a guy named Joe Howe. He was my daddy-in-law's closest friend. He was a drunk. And in the hospital, they'd given up on him. They said that the booze had done so much to his body, it had damaged his brain, mm -hmm. and that if he ever got out of the hospital, he'd be nothing more than a vegetable. Mm -hmm. My pastor that preached me to Jesus led him to the Lord in the hospital. Amen. Joe Howe got saved. Joe Howe glorified God with a shout and a holy life. Amen. He threw down the bottom. Thank you, Jesus. He'd come to church and he'd glow like a light bulb. Yes, Lord. Amen. And if you didn't like to be hugged, you just had to stay away from Joe Howe. Amen. Amen. Male or female doesn't matter. He's like, well, come up and just hug you around with a bear. Amen. Joe was glad that he was saved. The Lord took care of him. Sin will destroy your marriage. Yes, <coughs> Jesus can fix it. Amen. Sin can destroy a lot of things prematurely yes, that Jesus is able to repair. Amen. Including your brain. Yep. Including your heart. If your heart's been broken, Jesus can fix it. Amen. Jesus can give you a new start. I'm glad I'm saved. 
Amen. If you're not saved, I'd like to encourage you to be saved today. Amen. I want to close with this one other thought about the Samaritan. After he fixed him up there, took care of him, and the Lord takes care of you. The Bible says, casting all your care upon him, because he careth for you. Over in 1 Peter chapter 5. And after he cared for him, I want you to notice in closing that protection for the man was delegated to someone while he went away. He took care of him, but then, for further care of him, in verse 35, on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host of the inn, gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. I know from the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament that when a person gets saved, the care of that individual is given to local New Testament churches. And if there's anybody who's supposed to care for young converts, it's Glenwood Baptist Church. Amen. And rather than say, well, I've seen him come and go. I wonder if he's going to last. Rather than do that, well, to do like the innkeeper who took him in and took care of him. The friend in the end was the host. Kind of reminds me of a local pastor overseeing a local church. God gives his sheep pastors, according to Ephesians chapter 4. And I believe every child of God who's not a pastor needs a pastor. Amen. And I believe God's got a pastor for you. Amen. There are no perfect pastors. There are no perfect churches. But I do believe that just like that you might believe that somebody's the perfect person for you to be married to, I believe God's got a church that's the perfect church for you. Amen. A pastor that's the perfect pastor for you. You stay around long enough, you'll find quickly they're not perfect. Yep. Yep. But it's the perfect one for you. Right. Notice not only the friend in the end, but the function of the end, and that is take care of him. I personally believe that the main function of the church assembled, the main function of the church assembled, is to take care of Christian people. Yeah. The church assembled. I believe our main function here is to help feed, nurture, and strengthen Christian people. If you and I are healthy in here, Jesus did not say, gather everybody in the church house and preach the gospel <coughs> to every preacher. Now I try to include the gospel every time we me. Amen. Okay? I try to make sure that if somebody comes in our services and they're unsaved, they'll hear how to be saved. Amen. But the main function of our messages and our ministry, when we assemble, I believe, is to take care of that new convert, take care of the old convert, strengthen them. Then, when we're healthy, you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to leave here. And we're supposed to go as representatives of the Lord. And you know what? On earth, you and I should be the good Samaritan. Amen. That goes out into the world and finds somebody else that's been beat up by sin. Yes, Lord. And by the Holy Ghost and by the power of the gospel, see them saved. Yes, Lord. And then bring them into the local church so that they can get strengthened. And hopefully one day, go out themselves. Yeah. to help others. Yeah. Now here's a message for unsaved people. Christ is the good Samaritan. Amen. Yes. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He paid for your sins and mine with his blood 2,000 years before you ever committed a single one of them. All of them under the blood and will be applied to you for your protection, for your salvation if you'll trust Him as your Savior. I would encourage you to do that today. Would you stand with me, please?